I got in my antiquarian copy first edition of the book Chanticleer. And uh, indeed, Cornelius Matthew's name is nowhere on this, except that some intrepid uh, acquisitions librarian had penciled it um, on the title page, and I committed the sacrilege of very carefully erasing it, um, which I've done with another book. It, it doesn't belong there by rights. I left it on the uh, earlier page there, so, you know, that's still there, but there's no reason it has to be prominently displayed on the title page. Looks like it erased pretty well. Um, this is 1850, first edition. I said uh, Cornelius Matthews is nowhere to be seen on this. Uh, where it where it is registered, it's registered by the publisher, J.S. Redfield, which I don't know if you can see that. Um, and I had uh, thought maybe to compare some of the style with Cornelius Matthews style. And this is always a little tricky if you've got a plagiarist because you don't know whether it's their work you're comparing or somebody else's. In this case, <clears throat> as I explained, I think what must have happened is that Matthew and Abby collaborated on this in 1834, 1835, while he was writing the five books that m historians have mistakenly attributed to Asa Green. And uh, since he was in the area where uh, his hometown and Abby's hometown, they probably got together and he probably assisted her with this one as well. And they collaborated. But primarily, I think this is Abby Poyan's book. Now, she is, as I've determined, one of the original co-authors of A Christmas Carol. But this was written probably first. I would guess this was written in 1834 and A Christmas Carol was started in 1838 and probably finished sometime in 1839. So this is a precursor work uh, collaborated on by the two of them. That's what I've extrapolated. I don't care how crazy this sounds to anybody now. It'll make sense someday. I'm quite sure. Anyway, um, I was going to pull out excerpts from some of uh, Cornelius Matthews' work and then compare by style. But I think I'll probably bore people with that. Um, anybody can go in and do that kind of work themselves. All of this, this book is available online and uh, Cornelius Matthews works are available online and anybody can do that for themselves. It's a total mismatch. There's no possible way that Cornelius Matthews wrote this book. Um, he's more worldly. He's kind of uh, uh, cynical and crass, even though he's politically liberal. And there's, there's a number of other things. He's not a spiritual guy. He's a worldly guy. Where he brings God or religion in, he brings it in to the narrative in such a way that it's not really a statement of faith. It's just, you know, brought in as a character. He's very much like Dickens. And it doesn't surprise me that Dickens apparently plagiarized um, the career of Puffer Hopkins uh, for... David Copperfield. He was charged with that, and there's some pretty strong evidence that he did that, and uh, I can see why, because <clears throat> Cornelius Matthews really wrote quite a bit like Dickens, you know, a worldly guy who uh, was kind of a sensationalist and actually a very good writer, I think. Edgar Allan Poe trashed him as a critic, and it was totally unfair. It was just personal, apparently. Uh, maybe he felt threatened, or maybe there was some other personal reason, but I think you have to take all of Edgar Allan Poe's literary criticism and just throw it out because the guy was just a bullshitter, you know, and he attacked people for the sake of attacking them and for the sake of making himself seem big. He wanted to leverage himself into that realm of literati and what better way to do it than to get himself a job as a critic and be taking pot shots at people, it, you know. So these are well written, these books by Cornelius Matthews, but they're not anywhere near in the style or the spiritual sensibilities of Chanticleer. So instead of making an actual comparison on that, what I'm going to do is first read you something that Matthew published in the New York Transcript. This is a newspaper, the third newspaper that was owned by Asa Green, uh, the first one being the Berkshire American in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, back in like 18. 26 or 7 or something like that. Matthew contributed to that one. Then when Asa Green moved to New York City in uh, late 1829, Matthew began writing for that paper while he was simultaneously pursuing a mercantile career. And very quickly, I would say at least by mid-1830, Matthew was the de facto editor of the Constellation. 
and was making all the editorial decisions, including printing his brother's work in it and also his friend Oliver Wendell Holmes. And uh, a lot of his own stuff under the pseudonym D and also unsigned as the editor. And then there was the cholera epidemic in 1832 and uh, that paper folded and Matthew left. And that's when I think he wrote these books that are falsely or incorrectly attributed to Asa Green. And also when he collaborated with Abby on Chanticleer. And um, then Asa Green launched the New York transcript. I think it was sometime in 1835. And Matthew went back to New York and probably resumed his mercantile career, but he also wrote for the transcript. Primarily, he did the uh, arraignments of police office, but uh, he also wrote some other things for the transcript. Now, um, he used the pseudonym Trismegistus in 1851-52 in the carpet bag. That was not Benjamin Drew, as the editor said it was, for some inexplicable reason. That was Matthew. He had actually used Trismegistus as a signature back in like 1828 for the New England Galaxy. And then again, for this paper in 1835, he used it a couple times. And these are two poems. They're back to back. And there was a convention apparently, that if somebody, if more than one of somebody's poems were printed in the paper, one over the other, they would only sign one of them. They would only give the signature once, not for both of them. I don't know why that is. It's very confusing because I don't think it's, you know, absolutely uh, locked in. That's, that's, that that's always the case. But apparently it was the case quite a number of times. I'm assuming that's the case here, especially since Matthew would have probably either inserted it himself if he was editing or arranged to have it inserted himself. This is in the June 29, 1835 edition of the New York Transcript. This first one is from the New Haven Herald. What this means is that Matthew, for a period of time, had been in Haverhill, apparently, and visiting with Abby. And so when he was not in New York City, he would submit to other newspapers, um, you know, usually in... Uh, you know, well, in other places in New England, he would submit to other newspapers, and then he would get them reprinted in the transcript when he got back. This is what I extrapolated. So this first one was written while he was visiting Abbey in Haverhill, and it was published in the New Haven Herald, and then when he got back up to New York, he uh, reprinted it in the transcript, and then below that is one that does not have any such indication that was probably written in New York. Now, there's a, there's a story in here. I know from the Constellation back in 1830, 31, 32, especially early in like 1830, that Matthew would make fun of Abby's woo-woo beliefs, you know, like uh, astrology was one of them and prescient dreams was another one that he made fun of. These would have been things that Abby was trying to teach him, and he would literally mock them in his newspaper, see, um, which I feel ashamed of at this point because he accepted these things later after she died, and I'm sure he kicked himself many times. So here, if I interpret correctly, he is making fun of her vegetarianism. Many years later, he became a vegetarian himself. In 1857, writing as Job, J-O-B, he advocates for the uh, vegetarian position, but here he's making fun of it. It's a very short poem. I'll read it. And it, it, the reason I'm reading this is it ties directly into what I'm going to read in the Chanticleer book. It's titled, A Small Specimen of the Fashionably Simple Style for the Lovers of Nature. Now, of course, Abby was a, a deep on the nature mystic, really speaking. So this is a jab at her, even though he loves nature himself. He says, yea, geese are good. A charm is theirs, which ducks, though fat and plump, have not though nourished by the summer airs and fatted in a swampy spot. And turkey, too. Oh, who would say that turkey is not very good? For search the land and search the sea, you cannot meet with better food. And beef, a well-cooked piece of beef. Oh, might I live existence or... This is probably a reference to her belief in reincarnation. I guess I just picked up on that. Oh, might I live existence or... And write again, life's checkered leaf beef would I ask and ask no more. She probably said that in a future life, you know, you'll pay for eating meats. And 
And then the last stanza is, and stewed or fried or roast or raw in busy life or lonely cloister, no saint or sinner ever saw a sweeter morsel than an oyster. And that's signed Tris Majestus, which again is kind of making fun of that idea because she had probably taught him uh, hermetic beliefs about Hermes. Tris Majestus, see? Well, Matthew mockingly used it as a pseudonym because it means thrice great, see? And that amused him. Well, She'd had enough, I think, because right below that is one a, a poem that he wrote to Abby from New York, being shocked that she has apparently broken things off because she just had it up to here, see? And she also felt that she, she couldn't marry a, a man that wasn't spiritual, see? And she'd been trying to convince herself that Matthew was spiritual, which he really was deep down. But she must have said, well, I can't marry this guy. So she must have broken it off. So he says... Oh, do not turn thy face away, sweet lady, dear from me. Soon, soon, alas, must end my day if I thy fizz don't see. So this is just like the raven. It's a, a, a mixture of humorous and serious. Matthew could never stay serious because he hid his feelings under humor, see? So that he's very serious about this because it's going to devastate him if Abby breaks it off. And yet he has to be silly. So he uses one of his favorite words, fizz. I'll have to look up in my database to see how many times Matthew used the word fizz. And we'll put that up on the screen. I'm going to start again. Oh, do not turn thy face away, sweet lady, dear from me. Soon, soon, alas, must end my day if I thy fizz don't see. In thy soft beams I live alive. From them I draw my light. And whilst they brightly on me shone, as seemed that all was bright. But now a dismal cloud appears to darken o'er my sky. My bosom heaves with restless fears. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Well, it's silly, but it's quite serious because he's, he's kind of joking about being in love, you know, unrequited love, but he's deadly serious. <laughs> Those are really his feelings. So now I've shared that with you. Now let's look at this because what we have, is the Peabody family on Thanksgiving going to church. And um, this starts out with Abby's prose, and you will see her spirituality and uh, sincere religious belief and commitment. And then you'll see that Matthew takes over with his sermon, which rather echoes this uh, silly poem here, see? So, uh, and, and if you compare this to... Um, to uh, Cornelius Matthews. It's just, like I said, it's not even worth my bothering with. Do it yourself, you know. It's obvious. Okay, so she says, will you pardon me? Wait a minute, I want to get a sip of water here. Hold that book way away. Okay, this is on page 96, if anybody wants to look it up. Will you pardon me, reader, if I fail to tell you whether this house of worship was of the Methodist, Episcopal, or Baptist creed? whether it had a chancel or altar or painted windows, whether the pews had doors to them and were cushioned or not, whether the minister wore a gown and bands or plain suit of black or was undistinguished in his dress. Now, this is Abby with her more advanced understanding of spirituality making a, a statement, an editorial statement, that it doesn't matter what denomination or what outer trappings you have. It, you know, what matters is what's in here and your relationship with the higher power, whatever you would like to call that. So this is written by a mystic. Will it not suffice if I tell you as the very belief of my soul that it was a Christian house, that there were seats for all, that for all, right? it's not underlined, but she's emphasizing it, that things were well intended and decently ordered and that with a hymn sung with such purity of heart that its praises naturally joined in with the chiming of the trees and the carols of the birds without and floated on without a stop to heaven when a meek man rose up. And here this meek man is going to give a speech. I thought it was the minister, but it's not. We don't know who the meek man is. There's a lot of clues in here and people who are committed to a spiritual path will pick up on them right away. And people who are not involved in spirituality will, you know, so there's no point in me explaining them. I'll just point out where she says um, that there were seats for all. That's the, the uh, inclusive 
universalist view, not that she was identified with universalism, but she believed that uh, all could come to God regardless and be received by him. And in the Christmas Carol, where Tiny Tim adds to Mr. Bob Cratchit's prayer, he says, God bless us, everyone. That was Abby expressing the same view. That was not just something that sounded good. Okay, Dickens left it in because it just sounds good. You know, it was not, that was a radical statement in that day. All right. Uh, so the meek man rose up some 200 years ago. Our ancestors, he said, finding themselves more comfortable in the wilderness of the new world than they could have reasonably looked for, set apart a day of thanksgiving to almighty God for his manifold mercies. That day, God be praised, has been steadily observed throughout this happy land by cheerful gatherings of families and other festive and devotional observances down to the present time. Our fathers coven covenanted in the love of Christ to cleave together as brethren, however hard the brunt of fortune might be. That bond still continues. We may not live, he went on, in the very spirit and letter of the first Thanksgiving discourse ever delivered amongst us, as retired hermits, each in our cell apart, nor inquire, like David, how liveth such a man? How is he clad? How is he fed? He is my brother. We are in league together, and we must stand and fall by one another. Is his labor harder than mine? Surely I will ease him. Hath he no bed to lie on? I have two. I will lend him one. Hath he no apparel? I have two suits. I will give him one of them. Eats he coarse food, bread, and water, and I have better? Surely we will part stakes. He is as good a man as I, and we are bound to each other, so that his wants must be my wants, his sorrows my sorrows, his sickness my sickness, and his welfare my welfare. This is basically communism. For I, but it's spiritual communism. For I am as he is. Such a sweet sympathy were excellent, comfortable, nay, heavenly, and is the only maker and observer of churches and commonwealths. Now, old Sylvester is the uh, patriarch of the Peabody family through whom Abby expresses spiritual thoughts. To such as looked upon old Sylvester, there seemed a glow and halo about his aged brow and whitened locks, for this was the very spirit of his life. I don't know if the meek man was Sylvester, probably was as though he knew the very secrets of their souls and touched their very heartstrings with a gentle hand, the preacher glanced from one member of the Peabody household to another as he proceeded something in this manner, and he's addressing each one, and he's addressing their failings in a Christian way. Now, Abby was a deep student of psychology. Wherever you see anything to do with psychology in A Christmas Carol, that was Abby. And here we have, for William Peabody, do I find on this holy day that I love God in all his glorious universe more than the image even of liberty? William Peabody was the political fellow. More than the image even of liberty, which hath ensnared and enslaved the soul of many a man on the coin of this world, parentheses, for buxom Mrs. Jane in her Van Dyke. Do I stifle the vanity of good looks and comfortable circumstances under a plain garb? for the jovial captain, kind of the, the perpetual little boy. <clears throat> Am I not over hasty in pursuit of carnal enjoyment? From Mr. Oliver, who was wiping his brow with the Declaration of Independence. He's a lover of the Declaration of Independence. And eager over much for the good opinion of men, when I should be quietly serving them without report? From Mrs. Carrick and her son, they're the rich ones. And what are pomp and fashion? but the painted signs of good living where there is no life. These, he continued, are all outward, mere pretenses to put off our duty and the care of our souls. Yea, we may have churches, schools, hospitals abounding, but these are mere lath and mortar. If we have not also within our own hearts a church where the pure worship ever goeth on, a school where the true knowledge is taught, a hospital, the door whereof standeth constantly open, 
into which our fellow creatures are welcomed and where their infirmities are first cared for with all kindness and tenderness. If these be our inclinings this day, let us be reasonably thankful on this Thanksgiving morning. Let such as are in health be thankful for their good case, and such as are out of health be thankful they are no, that they are no worse. Let such as are rich be thankful for their wealth, if it hath been honestly come by, and let such as are poor be thankful that they have no such charge upon their souls. Let old folks be thankful for their wisdom in knowing that young folks are fools, and let young ones be thankful that they may live to see the time when they may use the same privilege. Let lean folks be thankful for their spare ribs, which are not a burthen in the harvest field. Fat folks may laugh at lean ones and grow fatter every day. Let married folks be thankful for blessings, both little and great. Let bachelors and old maids be thankful for the privilege, privilege of kissing other folks' babies and great good may it do them. With what a glow of mutual friendship the quaint preacher was warming the plain old meeting house on that Thanksgiving day. All right, so the, all of that is Abby. And you can see she's kind of old-fashioned Victorian, that this is really not written in 1850. This is written in 1835, and that she's old school. You know, she's, she's brilliant, she's deeply insightful, she's deeply spiritual, but she's an old-style Victorian. Now, suddenly, Matthew comes in, okay? Matthew has taken up the pen here, in my opinion. And he says, finally, and to conclude, he's adding this, because that was, that was the end. When, when Abby wrote, with what a glow of mutual friendship the quaint preacher was warming the plain old meeting house on that Thanksgiving day. That, that's Abby's wrap-up, see? But now Matthew's going to continue it. Finally, and to conclude, he went on in the language of a chronicle of the time. I'd have to, that might date it. I'd have to check on where that is. Let no man look upon a turkey today and say, this also is vanity. What is the life of man without creature comforts and the stomach of the son of man with no aid from the tin kitchen? Despise not the day of small things while there are pullets on the spit and let every fowl have fair play between the jaws of thy philosophy. See, see the, the humor and the sarcasm and the, the love of meat and so on to suddenly come into this? Are not puddings made to be sliced and pie crust to be broken? Go thy ways then according to good sense. He's writing like almost biblical language and he's done that elsewhere he's written in biblical language about other things uh, go thy ways then according to good sense good cheer good appetite the governor's proclamation and every other good thing under the sun render thanks for all the good things of this life and good cookery among the rest eat drink and be merry make not a lean laudation of the bounties of providence but let a lively gusto follow a long grace feast thankfully and feast hopefully Feast in goodwill to all mankind, Grahamites included. Feast in the full and joyous persuasion. And it goes on. Um, Let a good stomach for dinner go hand in hand with a good mind for sound doctrine. Let us all be thankful that a gracious providence hath furnished each and all with a wholesome and bountiful dinner this day. <laughs> you see the difference in the writing, you know? And, and I'm sure that Abby would not have been terribly pleased with this. But it stayed in. Um, she was gradually cleaning him up, not only culturally, but spiritually. Uh, she was teaching him, giving him a, a full uh, education, full liberal education. She was teaching him spiritually. And she was also cleaning him up in terms of his manners because he was a farm boy. He was like, he had a kind of an education, but she really like uh, uh, transformed him. I would say. And so he doesn't sound like this in later years. He becomes a follower of Emanuel Swedenborg, and then he becomes a spiritualist, and he studied and accepted the uh, deep mysticism that Abby had taught him. Whether it was in, in time before she died, I think she was able to see the transformation in him largely. But when she died in 1841, March of 1841, he, he had accepted most of the things that she taught, but most of it was intellectual. So when he gets to December of 1841 and writes The Raven about an experience he had, uh, the, the first two, three stanzas are literal for him. And he was studying her old books and hoping for a sign from her and a visitation from her. But he wasn't 
uh, strong enough in his faith at that point. So he lapsed back into cynicism. See, that's what that whole poem is about. And then later on, he uh, was able to fully embrace the thing that she taught. And I even have, I think it's 1855, where as a member of the Portland Spiritualist Association, uh, in a, a little subcommittee of that group, they investigate a seance for several nights in a row, uh, physical mediumship, and they attest to the physical phenomena that they saw, and all the members sign their name at the bottom. And Matthew probably wrote it. It's in the Portland transcript. And he, his signature is in amongst the others as having seen all sorts of, you know, uh, physical mediumship. So he moved from this state of cynicism that we see here of what Abby was trying to teach him all the way to 1855, signing his name at the bottom of this testimony. Uh, his name is also on a petition to Congress. I forget, 15,000 name signatures. Petition to Congress in 1854, asking Congress to investigate spiritualist phenomena. See, his signature is on that as well. You can look that up. It's, it's under M.F. Whittier without the periods. I think you can look it up that way. So uh, that is Chanticleer, and it's, the spine is uh, worn. The, the uh, covers are not coming off, but the spine is worn. The inside is in beautiful condition for a for, first edition, 1850. It's just beautiful. Uh, I actually ordered two. The second one, they canceled the order because they had lost the book, so they said. A lot of times I think it means they sold it to somebody else and just forgot to take the listing off. So I was only able to get the one. You can't find this anywhere. You can find the ones that have um, Cornelius Matthews' name printed on the title page from 1856, 1868. Uh, but you can't find this one that does not have Cornelius Matthews' name in it, except for where it's erasable. Uh, so that's it. I just wanted to show you Chanticleer. Uh, again, anybody can go into Cornelius Matthews' books and, uh, and see immediately that it's a total mismatch in terms of his uh, religious life and in terms of his writing style. It brings into question, why can't this be corrected? There's a number of these attributions. Why can't this be changed since it's so obvious, you know? And there's others that are even more obvious, like the rag picker or bound and free, which Matthew published anonymously in 1855, is obviously not George Burnham, George Pickering Burnham whom it's been attributed to, nobody will touch this. No librarian will work with me. No scholar will work with me. And as far as the rag picker is concerned, when Academia EDU sent out an automatic, automated message inviting members to contribute a 1,600-word paper, that same day I immediately sent a paper regarding the real authorship of the rag picker or bound and free. I was supposed to hear back in one or two weeks. It's been over a month. I don't know if I'll ever hear back. Um, if anybody wants to steal it, they'll find it particularly difficult because I've already published on this. I don't know quite how to put this, but the recalcitrance, the stubbornness, the irrational stubbornness of the academic world, which other people have remarked on as well. Michael Cremo and people like that uh, have remarked on this. I mean, it's amazing. You know, uh, one person put it very euphemistically that academia is conservative. Well, they're not conservative. I mean, it's more than that. They're irrational. <laughs> they're political and they're irrational in their stubbornness, you know, and how to break through, you know. What you'd have to do, here's my editorial and I'll cut this short real quick. What you'd have to do is to either go through the academic system to get your Ph.D., ignorantly and then suddenly have some kind of awakening. Now this happens to people because they get married to somebody who's uh, more spiritually aware and they get awakened by their spouse. And so they've got the degree, they've got the prestige and all of a sudden they undergo some kind of tr transformation, a metamorphosis, and they start studying uh, non-physical realities see, or alternative viewpoints. Or you'd have to have somebody that was completely undercover, that just literally played along with the entire system until they could get out and make a name for themselves and then suddenly reveal themselves, you know. Well, I'm not doing either one of those things. I mean, 
I'm just being myself with 11 years of good research and I'm knocking on the door and I'm being studiously ignored, we'll see. Um, anyway, I'm going to put uh, some archival plastic as a, as a cover on this and uh, put it very proudly in my collection because this is the only novel that's substantially written by Abby Poy and Whittier other than A Christmas Carol that I know of. Um, and it provides a nice precursor in many respects, style-wise. Hopefully it'll be analyzed in that way in the future. So uh, for anybody who listened to all of this, thank you very much for uh, listening to all of my presentation and not just uh, dipping into the first five minutes. And uh, I don't know what else is on the horizon. There really isn't anything particularly that I have going. <clears throat> but the next time something comes up, I will see you then.